At Matthew 24, 45 to 47, we read that for the time of the end, Jesus would appoint a faithful and discreet slave or governing body to explain the Bible to his followers and help them to grow in understanding of the truth. Whereas Jesus' teachings and the written word of God are inspired, the faithful and discreet slave is not inspired. Holy ashtray! Now hold on a second, just because it came out of a governing body's mouth on JW Broadcast doesn't really mean anything. Most witnesses don't watch the broadcast. Actually, more apostates watch the, the broadcast than witnesses actually do, so eh, it doesn't mean much. Actually, what means a little bit more is the Watchtower article that for next year's February edition actually means a little bit more. Under the subheading, who really is the faithful and discreet slave? Let's begin reading. Who really is the faithful and discreet slave? Paragraph 12. The governing body is neither inspired nor infallible. Holy showcase! Therefore, it can err in doctrinal matters or in organizational direction. Holy haberdashery! In fact, the Watchtower Publications Index includes the heading, Beliefs Clarified, which lists adjustments in our scriptural understanding since 1870. Holy jack-in-the-box! Of course, Jesus did not tell us that his faithful slave would produce perfect spiritual food. So how can we answer Jesus' question, who really is the faithful and discreet slave, at Matthew 24, verse 45? What evidence is there that the governing body is filling that role? Let us consider the same three factors that directed the governing body in the first century. And the, the, the magazine goes on to talk about how they are directed by Holy Spirit. Well, let me ask this simple question. What would be the difference between being directed and guided by Holy Spirit and inspired by Holy Spirit? Um, I can't really fit my head around that one. It just kind of seems odd to me. So, you're inspired, yet you're not inspired. Okay, this leads to some very interesting questions. If you've gotten a bunch of stuff wrong before and you're infallible, why is it that we have to listen to every word, every utterance that comes from Jehovah's mouth? I mean, the organization's mouth. Why is that? Now, if they're not inspired, if they could be wrong. Why is it that if you go against, openly go against one of the teachings of the governing body, you get disfellowshipped? You lose out on your family, you lose out on your friends, you could lose your job, you could lose your house, you could lose your spouse. Why is it that that holds true if they could be wrong on any one of their doctrines, including the disfellowshipping one? What about the blood issue? How many people have died due to the blood issue? Jehovah's Witnesses, could they be wrong on the blood issue? It's an open question to think about. Because if they're wrong on one little thing, if, they're, if they were wrong on beards for so long, up until last month, you couldn't have a beard. Now all of a sudden you can have a beard? If they were so wrong in a beard, what else have they been wrong about? That's just something to ponder. That is something to think about. And look, let's be honest. They've made that statement before. They've made the statements before that they're not inspired. It's happened in their literature before. They've made the statements before that they're imperfect humans, just like all of us. Now let me ask this, though. If they're imperfect, why do we have to listen to them? Oh wait, it's because they're Jehovah's spiritually guided organization. They're not inspired, but they're spiritually directed. Once again, I fail to wrap my head around this. I understand that witnesses 
believe that this organization is true. They believe that while it may have its thought, its faults, it is God's organization. But remember, okay, wait, hold up. So Jehovah's empowering these people with Holy Spirit. Yet every time you go out in service, he empowers you. Every time you pray for Holy Spirit, he will empower you. If you're going through tough times, he will empower you. Well, what the fuck's you different than the governing body then? Oh, wait, you're not anointed. But then what about all the anointed people? Okay, well, they're not the governing, they're, they're no longer the faithful and discreet slave. That's the governing body that's a faithful and discreet slave. What sets the governing body apart from the regular anointed rank and file if they're not inspired? If they don't have some sort of special power, special ability that everybody else doesn't get? And yet, if you go on JW.org, you will see tons and tons of articles, including many videos for children, saying that Jehovah's Holy Spirit will be with them. Okay, once again, what's the difference between the governing body and the rank and file? If they're not inspired, how the hell did in 1919 or 1918, that doctrine keeps on flipping, they became the chosen organization. How does that work? Please explain to me this, because it doesn't make sense. This organization loves to flip-flop on their doctrine. And yes, I understand this is something that they're saying right now due to all the court cases that are going on. And if you don't believe me, look up the child abuse cases. Look up the Australian Royal, Royal Commission. But I get it. I get it. This will be right back to normal in a few months. I get that. But Watchtower is setting themselves up for a quagmire. They are setting themselves up for destruction with this newest teaching because it follows in the next month's Watchtower with something even more damning to them than sitting there and saying that they're not inspired and that they are imperfect. So let's go ahead and let's read that one. And this article is far more damning than the previous article, and it's far more damning than the previous video because of the ramifications that it has for the organization going forward. Found in the March 2017 study edition of the Watchtower, under the article, Exercise Faith Decide uh, Wisely, and then the subheading, Should Others Make Decisions for Us? Paragraph 8 reads as followed. Now, I'm going to hop in here a little bit to extrapolate exactly what they are getting at and exactly what we can get from this. So, paragraph 8. The above mentioned examples convey to us a clear lesson. It is up to each of us to make decisions and the wise right choices are based upon sound scriptural knowledge. Each one of us will carry his own load of responsibility. We should not give someone else the responsibility to make decisions for us. Example, the governing body. Rather, we should personally learn what is right in God's eyes and choose to do it. In other words, learn exactly what the governing body has to say because the watchtower is more important than the Bible. The watchtower has replaced the Bible, so therefore, you find them in a little conundrum right here of you should know what's right from us, but it's up to you to make your own decisions and not us to tell you what decisions to make. It's, it's, it's a, it's a circular thing. It's just going to keep on going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. It's a mind screw. It makes no sense. But paragraph nine, how might we give into the danger of letting others choose for us? Peer pressure could sway us to make a bad decision. Once again, peer pressure from worldly people, or how about this? Peer pressure at the hall. Perhaps that hospital liaison committee that comes around and tells you not to give blood whenever you need it for an operation. Whenever you need it to save somebody's life, they sit there and tell you not to do it and you give in to the peer pressure of them. Eh, might be what they're talking about. 
Still, no matter how others try to pressure us, it is our responsibility to follow our Bible-trained conscience. In many respects, if we let others make our decisions, we are essentially deciding to follow them. So, if we let the governing body decide for us what to do, well then, see what I said earlier. Is it still a choice? It, it is still a choice, but a potentially disastrous one. Paragraph 10. The Apostle Paul clearly alerted the Galatians to the danger of letting others make personal decisions for them. Some in the congregation wanted to make the make personal choices in order of for others in order to alienate them from the apostles why those selfish ones were seeking prominence they overstepped proper bounds and did not respect their fellow christians responsibility to make their own decisions right there it's a bash at apostates because we actually want to help you out uh, so that you can actually make your own decision um, see, we're going to tell you what Watchtower says, we're going to tell you our opinion on it, we're going to show you where it's wrong, but it's up to you to make your own decision. We're not going to make the decision for you, unlike what they're trying to tell you. So, paragraph 11. Paul set a fine example of respecting his brother's right of free will to make decisions. Today, when giving counsels on matters involving personal choice, the elders should follow that pattern. Holy hole in a donut! They are happy to share Bible-based information with others in the, the flock. Still, the elders are careful to allow individual brothers and sisters to make their own decisions. Holy birthday cake! This is logical because those individuals will bear the responsibility for the results. Here's an important lesson. We can show helpful interest in others and call attention to scriptural principles or counsel. Still, others have the right and responsibility to make their own decisions. When they do this wisely, they benefit. Clearly, we should avoid any tendency to think that we are authorized to make decisions for other brothers and sisters. Holy conflagration! Okay, let's extrapolate from this. And why is it so damning, okay? Elders hold a great amount of control over people. The governing body holds a great amount of control over people. Essentially what this is saying is you have the right to make your own decisions based upon your own Bible knowledge. Elders can't make the decision for you. And likewise, the elders, well, they've got elders too. The circuit overseer, the providing overseers over the congregation, or now it's the Kobe, is the head of the the head of the elders at a congregation he's the lead elder but he takes his marching orders from the circuit overseer and district overseers who in turn take their marching orders from the governing body so the governing body is the elders of the elders of the elders so which are in turn the elders of all of us so whenever they come up with a decision, oh, it's up to us to decide whether or not we should follow it, whether or not we should allow them to make the decisions for us. Now, see, this opens up a can of worms. Now, not immediately, but future down the line, this will open up a can of worms for them because all one has to do is go forward to their judicial meeting and you can't be this fellowship for apostasy going forward. Now, right now you can, but going forward after all these court cases and going down the line of probably 10, 15 years in the future, this is a ways out and they're going to flip flop on this several times over before they have to come back to it. But essentially apostasy will now no longer be a disfellowshipping offense because you're allowed to make your own decisions. You're allowed to extrapolate. You understand that the governing body is infallible, so they can make mistakes. So because they can make mistakes, their mistakes should not ruin your life. You have to sit there and decide whether or not you want to go along with something. The elders make mistakes. Therefore, you don't have to go along with them. You can come to your own conclusions, and therefore you can't be disfellowshipped for it. You can go 
into a judicial committee for the biggest sin of all. Well, the second biggest sin, apostasy is number one, but number two, sex. You touched a boob. Oh no, evil person. Your family should shun you for life until you come back to Jehovah, that is a year or two later down the line, depending upon which elders you have and your status before in the congregation, determining how long you're gonna be out for. But that being said, All you have to do is now go on in and say, when they say you realize that fornication is wrong, well, I don't see it that way. Well, I see this as talking about back in the day whenever women were considered property because whenever you could get a higher dollar value for a woman uh, if she was pure and she was a virgin. So it made sense to want to keep her a virgin because the family could make more money off of her. Oh, 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 hold up. Going to the New Testament? Oh, well, actually, whenever it's raining and raving against that, it was actually condemning the Romans because it was their practice of having extramarital affairs, fornicating before marriage, um, including having sex with children was part of their society. So actually, this was more so uh, their way of attacking the Romans verbally without actually uh, drawing attention to it. So you could come up with that excuse and congratulations, you can't be disfellowship for it. Now, granted, I have said this and I will say it again. Right now, you can be. But going forward in the future, we're talking a decade out, maybe 15 years out, that will cease to be the case because of all these little changes that they're doing because of these lawsuits. They are making these changes, Jehovah's Witnesses, because of all the lawsuits that they're going through, specifically the Australian Royal Commission, which is about to, to start up again next March. And I urge everyone that's a Jehovah's Witness to watch it. Don't watch it on YouTube. Go to their actual site and watch it. Watch play by play. Last time around was great. You saw a governing body member completely lie on the stand. And some of these articles, are actually fixing to try to, to make sure it wasn't perjury whenever he sat there and said that it would be presumptuous to think that the governing body was the only group that Jehovah was using on earth, the only group that God was using. It would be presumptuous of them to assume that. And see this, this is one of those, those are these, these are the articles that they're basically sitting there and saying, hey, we could be wrong, you need to make up your own decision. They have to do it. They have to do it for legal reasons. Now behind the scenes still, they're gonna disfellowship for apostasy. Behind the scenes, even though it says this stuff here, you still have to go along with what they say. But down the line, when all these trials go underway, whenever somebody brings forward a lawsuit because of the disfellowshipping policy and it blatantly goes against what they're teaching here, well, that's gonna change. And besides that, they still have the regular shepherd the flock up, the flock book. Now until they update it once again, this is gonna hold true. But under chapter five of the shepherd the flock book, which is the secret book that the, the elders have Chapter five deals all with the process and the different ways that you can be disfellowshipped. Now, number 16 on there is apostasy found on page 65. Now, let's notice what it says about apostasy. Apostasy is a standing away from true worship, i.e. standing away from the organization, a following away, defection, rebellion, or abandonment which includes, okay, celebrating holidays, we got that, who cares, um, participating in interfaith activities. So if you were to go to a different church, you could get this fellowship. Um, but here's the, here's the thing, deliberately spreading teachings contrary to Bible truth as taught by Jehovah's Witnesses, i.e. the governing body. Any with sincere doubts should be helped. In other words, if they come to you because they've got a problem, then it's beat them over the head until they see your 
until they see the governing body's side of thinking. And if they don't, kick them out. If they go and start saying it to other members of the congregation, kick them out. Holy Benedict Arnold. Well, thanks to these articles, anybody now can go forward and show that essentially these articles are lying. However, in the future, these articles are going to have to take effect just due to all the lawsuits. And I urge anybody, anybody out there that's watching this that has any way to contact the Australian Royal Commission to bring up the disfellowshipping process at the next go around. Be, and bring up these articles and show that these articles are not exactly the case. <clears throat> because if they do that, this fellowshipping is over. At least in that country and a few others. It's over. Because at that point, they're going to have to be a kinder, gentler religion. Less culty, less high pressure control. Because... If they don't, they're going to lose their tax-exempt status, which they don't want. So they're going to have to change and be more inclusive. They're going to. It's inevitable. And these articles right here are what are going to be Watchtower's downfall in the near future. might be a decade away, but it will happen. It will happen to where the, the disfellowshipping processes will be gone. It will start being more personal choice. It has to. Now, they're going to try to be as hardcore as they possibly can for as long as they can. But eventually, they're going to let up. So stay alive till 2075. <laughs>
we are surrounded by a sea of lies and misrepresentations. Yes, your members have been surrounded by it for over a century and counting. How about telling them about the lies and misrepresentations that caused you to withdraw the book, should you believe in the Trinity, when you were called out about your numerous misquotes and misrepresentations? Only recently, a Professor Rama Singh called you out on misquoting him in your January 2015 Awake magazine. Satan is the father of the lie, but today there are many children of the lie. Like the religious organization telling people they have no heavenly hope, teaching that wonderful people like Abraham down to John the Baptist have no hope of going to heaven, but that the governing body, like Russell, Rutherford, and so-called anointed Jehovah's Witnesses do. How about the vicious lie that God trusts an established false teacher completely, and the suggestion that Watchtower members do the same? How about the ridiculous lie that Jesus appointed you all in 1919? Satan is the father of the lie, but today there are many children of the lie. You are condemned by your own words, sir. Every one of us is affected. We are surrounded by a sea of lies. Yes, sir. And Watchtower members have been drowning in it for well over a hundred years. A lie is a false statement deliberately presented as being true, a falsehood. A lie is the opposite of the truth. Lying involves saying something incorrect to a person who is entitled to know the truth about a matter. But there is also something that is called a half-truth. The Mexican authorities were entitled to it when you lied to them that you were a cultural organization, weren't they? That was not even a half-truth. What cultural work do you do? And on top of that, you practiced deception by instructing members in that country to not use the Bible and prayer in public worship. It was a half-truth when you celebrated the change, giving the rest of your members the world over the impression that it was the Mexican government that banned the use of the Bible and prayer when you were the ones who actually imposed that ban to cover up your tracks. The Bible tells Christians to be honest with each other. Now that you have put away deceit, speak truth, wrote the Apostle Paul at Ephesians 4.25. Yet you cannot find it in yourself to be honest with your members. Lies and half-truths undermine trust. A German proverb says, who lies once is not believed even if he says the truth. Yet you had the gall, the temerity to print that God trusts you, serial liars, completely. So we need to speak openly and honestly with each other, not withholding bits of information that could change the perception in the listener or mislead him. Have you been honest with Watchtower members about Beth Serim? the house that was built to house Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, and others you expected to be resurrected in 1925 as princes in the new paradise earth, you tried to give the impression that it was just built as a token, that you believed they would be resurrected. No, the house was built to house them, even after your 1925 prophecy failed. Companies sometimes lie in advertisements regarding their products. For instance, the Watchtower, available in over 210 languages, explains Bible prophecy, increases our comprehension of deep spiritual truths, and motivates us to live by Bible principles. Awake magazine, published in some 100 languages, broadens our knowledge of Jehovah's creative works and shows us how to apply the Bible's practical counsel. No mention that these magazines have printed countless doctrinal lies that had to be changed and adjusted repeatedly over the decades. Regarding our preaching work during the First World War, one brother wrote, God's servants were energetically distributing the seventh volume of studies in the scriptures entitled The Finished Mystery. It was reaching an unprecedented distribution. No mention that that book had so many bizarre false prophecies and false doctrines, 
a current member would cringe at reading. No mention that he would never want a current member to read it. As a grand finale, a hundred copies of the booklet Millions Now Living Will Never Die are distributed, along with some in English, German, and Italian. The lecture is a success. Word spreads. Two evenings later, the hall is packed for another lecture. Cleverly, no mention that it taught Paradise Earth would see its restoration in 1925. What did he say about lying again? So we need to speak openly and honestly with each other, not withholding bits of information that could change the perception in the listener or mislead him. Yet, in this very broadcast, he made reference to two Watchtower articles that did just that. The Watchtower of January 15, 2012 said on page 8, quote, Other champions of Bible truth rose up in the centuries that followed. Let's turn to that article right now. Other champions of Bible truth rose up in the centuries that followed. John Wycliffe, circa 1330 to 1384. William Tyndall, circa 1494 to 1536. Henry Grew, 1781 to 1862. And George Storrs, 1796 to 1879. The Word of God is not bound. Try as they might, enemies of Bible truth have been unable to prevent its spread. The Word of God is not bound, says 2 Timothy 2.9. In 1870, a group of sincere Bible students began searching for the truth. Their method of study? Someone would raise a question. They would discuss it. They would look up all related scriptures on the point, and then, when they were satisfied with the harmony of these texts, they would finally state their conclusion and make a record of it. Does it not reassure you to know that like the apostles and older men of the first century, those faithful men, our spiritual ancestors of the late 1800s, were determined to align their beliefs solidly with God's Word? No mention here that they failed so miserably in aligning their beliefs with God's Word that not one of their publications from that time is used by the organization today. No mention that their conclusions led to one grave error after another. So for the article to hint that they were spreading the truth is one big fat lie. Try as they might, enemies of Bible truth have been unable to prevent its spread. This organization is so full of deception, I can confidently expect to find deception as I did even when this man is discussing the subject of the truth. So when this member of the governing body spoke about speaking the truth to Watchtower members without withholding bits of information, he was being classically hypocritical, for that has been the modus operandi of the organization he helps to govern. Then there are religious lies. If Satan is called the father of the lie, then Babylon the Great, the global empire of false religion, can be called the mother of the lie. And the Watchtower is right there as a part of Babylon the Great, the mother of the lie, by its own criterion. All the churches of Christendom were included in modern-day Babylon. Why? Because they all taught doctrinal lies. Individual false religions could be called daughters of the lie. Obviously, that must include the individual false religion that far outpaces others with doctrinal lies. Some lie by saying that sinners will get tormented in hell forever. Others lie by saying, once saved, always saved. Again, others lie by saying that the earth will be burned up on judgment day and all good people will go to heaven. And others lie that the second coming of Jesus took place in 1914 and that only the governing body and a few so-called anointed Jehovah's Witnesses will go to heaven, claiming that the great crowd will remain on earth. And even though the Bible describes the great crowd as robed in white, your magazines frequently show a few people saved on earth, not in white robes, but in ordinary clothes. What if an entrepreneur tells his bookkeeper to falsify the entries in the books in order to save on taxes? 
Mexico again. This was done to avoid government holding on to their buildings. It was a serious lie. This lying to the tax office is certainly a serious lie. It is a deliberate attempt to mislead somebody that has the right to know. It also robs the government of what they have established as legal income. Oh, I never knew the organization was in any way concerned about the rights of government. I guess not the Mexican government. Since Jehovah hates liars, we should avoid all lies, not just big or malicious lies. So what would make Jehovah hate liars and trust you completely? Do you see how much of an outrageous liar this organization is? But can we find the truth? Some say, truth is relative. It is like saying, this is truth for you and this is truth for me. This claim is not logical when it comes to religious truth. Either God is a trinity or he is not. Either the soul is mortal or it is not. Either there is a future paradise on earth or there is not. Either homosexuality is acceptable to God or it is not. Either participating in wars is permissible or it is not. Either Jesus returned in 1914 or he did not. Either you have the truth or you do not. Either you are still roving about in search of the truth or you are not. We are still roving about. Well, thank you. More on that later. Truth is definite, not relative, because Jehovah conveyed the truth to his servants. Psalm 43 verse 3 says, Send out your light and your truth. Jehovah is a revealer of truth. So who was it that conveyed to you that Jesus returned invisibly in 1874 or that God was going to destroy Christians by millions in 1918? Who was it that conveyed to you that your organization was under modern day Babylonian captivity since 1918 or that the generation that was old enough to witness with understanding the events of 1914 was the generation mentioned by Jesus in Matthew 24 that would not pass away before the end. That is why it is good to do daily Bible reading with meditation and weekly family worship. Wait a minute. Did he say weekly family worship? Am I to understand that the organization does not push daily family worship? That's strange. Anyhow, moving right along. At Matthew 24, 45 to 47, we read that for the time of the end, Jesus would appoint a faithful and discreet slave or governing body to explain the Bible to his followers and help them to grow in understanding of the truth. Lie. That will go down as a malicious lie with a deliberate attempt to deceive. The Bible says no such thing. Again, not even your own Bible. Whereas Jesus' teachings and the written word of God are inspired, the faithful and discreet slave is not inspired. Jehovah's servants have recognized that, not the traditions and creeds of uninspired men, but the Holy Scriptures, provide the standard for discerning what is truth. To say that we need to rely also on the unstable thinking of imperfect, Uninspired men is to deny the power of God. If you are not inspired, that puts you on the same level and in the group of uninspired men who have been teaching the world false doctrines, as you have pointed out. More of the people around the earth are becoming too enlightened to swallow her false doctrines any longer, such as eternal torment of immortal human souls in a hell of literal fire and brimstone managed by devils, also an inexplainable trinity of three co-equal persons in one God, the infallibility of the Pope of Vatican City, the end of the world in a fire that destroys our earth and all the stars of the heavens, and other related doctrines that are mere traditions of uninspired men. And the fact that you, as uninspired men, have taught more false doctrines and more false prophecies than any other Christian denomination you can point out, brings you 
on a lower level than them, I would say. Whereas in the first century, there was supernatural knowledge available for apostles and Bible writers, in the time of the end, Jehovah does not bestow this miraculous gift anymore, as explained at 1 Corinthians 13.8. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 8 does not teach that supernatural knowledge available to apostles would no longer be available today. That is simply not true. Yet another doctrinal lie from the champion of false doctrines. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. It is really amazing the simplistic, silly, ridiculous interpretations that these men apply to the scriptures. More amazing is how, with such imbecilic applications of the scriptures, they wield so much influence. I have always understood what Paul meant a particular way. For a moment there, I wondered if I was correct. I just thought I'd search for commentaries on the verse only to find this explanation that reveals what I've always understood the verse to be saying. I'm reading verbatim from an article, the link of which I have posted in the description below. It is from the website of the United Church of God. It says, The need to speak under God's inspiration will never cease. We cannot understand God's words written over thousands of years without inspired speaking or teaching. That, folks, is what Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit to do for us. Every time the Holy Spirit reveals something to us, that is divine inspiration. It continues, on the other hand, in the sense of future events, prophecies are time-sensitive. Consequently, once the prophecy is accomplished, it ceases in that there is no longer a need to wait for the event. For example, prophecies about events preceding the return of Christ will cease or become idle after his return. Said another way, prophecies are helpful for a limited time in contrast to the eternal benefit of love. The analogy continues with languages. They are only meaningful as long as there are people who speak them. When there is only one language, the need to speak other languages cease. And knowledge about a specific matter is temporary. For example, knowing how to operate a typewriter is no longer a useful skill. Love, however, never becomes absolute. That, ladies and gentlemen, is not rocket science. That is what I understood Paul to be saying from day one. I did not need to go researching it. If from that verse... The Watchtower can conclude that divine inspiration no longer exists today. Then by the same token, it should conclude that knowledge no longer exists today. And I'm going to show you the nonsense of this teaching of theirs in a little while. Their sordid record of ever-changing doctrines is coming to haunt them. They now need a convenient out, so they are not inspired, they claim. But they have ever claimed to be spirit-directed. What is the difference between being directed by the Holy Spirit and being inspired by the Holy Spirit? If the Holy Spirit is directing you, he is inspiring you. Unless, of course, they are being led by some other spirit. And you know my position on that. They were never directed by the Holy Spirit in the first place because Rutherford taught that at the time that this current organization claims it was appointed, the Holy Spirit had ceased to function. They must then tell you which spirit has been directing them, especially given their confession of being uninspired. In 1939, Rutherford stated in his book, Salvation, In that year the Lord Jesus came to the temple of Jehovah God. The Holy Spirit that had been the guide of God's people, having performed its functions, was taken away. The organization no longer teaches that. Or does it? To say that Jehovah no longer uses the Holy Spirit as he did back then is to bring that false doctrine back through the back door. But it gets worse. Although there is no divine inspiration today, 
Still, Jesus leads his people progressively through the services of the faithful slave. That blasphemous statement is suggesting that the Holy Spirit is no longer used to do what Jesus promised he would do, that is, guide us into all truth. But the undisputed champion of false doctrines, the champion of doctrinal lies, would dare to remove the Holy Spirit and put itself in his place. What blasphemy to suggest that these firmly established false teachers, these uninspired men at Watchtower headquarters, are now doing the work of the Holy Spirit. Have mercy. And why would Jesus have used inspired men to lead his early church, but uninspired ones for the last day church? Jesus trusts that the imperfect faithful slave will do its best to convey spiritual food. Do you also trust the slave? Here we go again. And the bizarre false doctrines continue. Whereas the truth of God's word does not change, our understanding of the truth does change because we are not perfect yet. How much more ridiculous will this broadcast get? If because you are not perfect yet, your understanding of the truth is changing, then come next year because you will still not be perfect then. Any understanding of the truth you currently hold and teach could very well change. I can assure you, you will not be perfect tomorrow. So your members should not then be surprised if they wake up in the morning to hear that a long-held belief has changed. And if that be the case, you need to change all this chat about having the truth or being in the truth to having or being in your understanding of the truth. The question at the beginning of the broadcast should then be, how would you react if one of your loved ones leaves our understanding of the truth. Let us ventilate the nonsense about the truth does not change, but our understanding of it does. Let's see. Is it that the truth about Jesus returning invisibly in 1874 has not changed, but your understanding of that truth is that he returned in 1914 instead? Could you say that the truth of what Jesus meant by this generation has not changed But your understanding of it has changed? Come to think of it. That is exactly correct. The truth of what Jesus meant has not changed. But your understanding of it has been constantly changing. Reality check. Your understanding has been wrong multiple times over. So what you have been teaching all this time is your false understanding of it. Not The truth. Two plus two is four. That is the truth. I am free to understand it to be two plus two equals six. I may tell people all I want to my heart's content that two plus two is twenty-two. And hey, because I am not perfect, I should be able to get a job as a kindergarten teacher to teach the children my understanding that 2 plus 2 equals 44. No big deal. I'll just tell the parents and the school administration that the truth of the matter does not change, but my understanding of it does. The only problem is, when you were telling people that millions alive in 1920 would not die, you were not telling them that was your understanding of the truth but rather a positive and indisputable conclusion. Clearly, if the truth never changes, but your understanding of it keeps changing because you are not perfect, then you do not teach the truth. You teach your ever-changing understanding of it. You do not have the truth. You have your ever-changing understanding of the truth. No matter how many times my understanding of 2 plus 2 changes, is my problem until I teach that 2 plus 2 equals 4. Daniel was told, Many will rove about, and the true knowledge will become abundant. This is a gradual process. We are still roving about. Well, thank you, sir, for that all-important confession. 
Now let's demonstrate the insanity, the sheer nonsense of what you just said, by reading what Daniel said, and I will use your translation. And as for you, O Daniel, make secret the words and seal up the book until the time of the end. Many will rove about, and the true knowledge will become abundant. When did Daniel say that true knowledge, according to your translation, will become abundant? The time of the end. Only a remnant of those selected for heavenly life remains here on earth in this time of the end. It was confirmed in your January 2016 Watchtower that we are living in the time of the end. And Daniel said that true knowledge, according to your Bible, will become abundant. So if Daniel says it will become abundant, and you are still roving about in this time of the end, what does that tell you? You said, At Matthew 24, 45 to 47, we read that for the time of the end, Jesus would appoint a faithful and discreet slave or governing body to explain the Bible to his followers and help them to grow in understanding of the truth. So how come the slave appointed by Jesus for the time of the end, living in the end when knowledge is abundant, is still roving about searching for the truth? Well, the nonsense continues. During the millennium, Jehovah will reveal additional truth to mankind. At Revelation 20, 12, it mentions scrolls that will be opened. The Apostle John reports that the dead are to be judged out of those things written in the scrolls according to their deeds. Evidently, then, these scrolls will contain additional information for mankind during the thousand years. Three things. One, the dead will be judged by the things written in the scrolls. Where then did you get it from that the living will be taught new things written in the scrolls? Two, John mentions the dead being judged by the things written in the scrolls after the millennium, not during. Three, has anyone noticed the great crowd? or part thereof, not wearing any white robes? Another indication of how these men are presenting their understanding of the truth and not what the Word of God teaches. After establishing they are still roving about, that their knowledge of the truth changes, the nonsense continues with him explaining how they know they have the truth. <laughs> I will spare you all and do not dignify that with a response. But among the nonsensical reasons for how they know they have the truth is that they are a people for God's name. Well, what of the assembly of Yahweh? Yahweh is a more accurate name for God than Jehovah any day. Any religious organization may choose to use God's name and that is no indication of them having the truth. Silly. Speaking of silly, this is where the broadcast demonstrated it should not be taken seriously. There are no other people on earth that are as spiritually free as we are. In my mid-teens, I began to feel torn. I liked the truth, but I felt so confined. I didn't tell anyone how I felt. I just pretended everything was alright and went through the motions. I envied kids who didn't have to live under so many restrictions. And then in this very broadcast came this. My name is Gabriella. Ben and I have always enjoyed attending the meetings. But lately, it's been difficult. Something was missing. Our son. Wow. 
Why are they crying? A spiritual problem. I was so torn. I was disappointed in Levi for leaving Jehovah, but I was more disappointed in myself. I felt like we failed him somehow. Oh boy, the guilt, the sadness, what spiritual freedom. I kept wondering how he was doing. Was he okay? She kept wondering how her son was doing, but she could not reach out to him because she is among the most spiritually free people in the world. When will they wake up to the reality of the pile of insanity being fed to them? Then, as hard as the past few weeks had been, it just got harder. I knew what the Bible said about quit mixing in company with anyone who is not living according to Christian standards. But I never thought that scripture would one day apply to me. Then it just got harder. The son text, but she cannot answer because she is so spiritually free. The twisting and misapplication of the scriptures without even arguing the bad theology. Would she be keeping company with her son if she answered his text message? And what evil to ignore his messages like that? That night, after the meeting, I told Ben about the text I received from Levi. I told him everything. How I miss Levi so much, but that I also wanted to be loyal to Jehovah. That is from one of the most spiritually free people on the planet. It just grates on my nerves to see people twisting the scriptures like that. Where can you find one passage in the Bible where God demands our loyalty by not responding to our children who try to contact us because they do not subscribe to the ever-changing understanding of the truth by a bunch of proven, established, uninspired, false teachers. I end this video commenting on all this insanity with the words of a member of the governing body who perfectly described what is happening here. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1 and 25, They exchanged the truth of God for the lie and venerated and rendered sacred service to the creation rather than the Creator.